Paul urged Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 1, I urged you when I went into Macedonia, remain in Ephesus, that you may charge some that they teach no other doctrine. So Timothy was to be aware and attentive to what was uh, being taught uh, around him, even there in particular among the saints, among the church. But later in the same book, he also told Timothy, take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this you will save both yourself and those that hear you. We've spent the past uh, 10 days, including today, at a, uh, a booth at the local fair. And the effort of that is, is multifaceted in, in many ways, but primarily it's an effort to meet people that we may not have an opportunity to, to meet otherwise, uh, to help them and to teach people from all kinds of backgrounds, to urge them to examine themselves or to, to re-examine themselves, to examine the Scriptures and to re-examine the Scriptures so that we might all understand what the gospel of Christ is, what, what the faith is. In the process of that, sometimes we uh, talk with someone long enough that we compare maybe their response to what the Scripture says, and maybe even we respond to their response, and that might continue. And that's what God expects us to do. In 2 Peter chapter 1, God expects us to do this because the promises of God are linked to the knowledge of God. Notice the connection between the promises and the knowledge of God in 2 Peter 1, 2, and 3. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, as His divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who called us by glory and virtue. And so we, we must have this knowledge. And then as Paul urged Timothy to do, we, we must share that knowledge and spread it as much as we can. And in the process of trying to persuade others, though, he urged Timothy, you also take heed to yourself. If we don't, then we may end up doing more harm than good in the process of what we believe we're doing is of sharing this knowledge. And one of the things to take heed of is what we read a few minutes ago in 1 Corinthians chapter 8. Uh, and that is taking heed to ourselves and the, the importance of knowledge with love. Because Paul says here that knowledge puffs up, but love edifies or love builds up. So turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 8, or I'll, I'll have the verses as we go through them on the screen as well. And, and the topics that we covered at the fair, um, they were not really the same topics that Paul is talking about in the majority of 1 Corinthians chapter 8. In this chapter, he's dealing with matters that are optional in the eyes of God, whether to eat a certain meat or not to eat a certain meat. And so he makes it clear in this, in verse 8, that in this topic, in this matter, if you eat or you don't eat, you're no better or worse either way. Well, we didn't go to the, to, to the fair to talk about things that are really neither better nor worse if you do or don't accept them, believe them, and practice them. But before Paul gets into that particular area of need in Corinth, the things that he says in verses 1 through 3 do apply to the kinds of things that we've been teaching and talking to others about over uh, the past few days. And so, it's, as we've spent a lot of time trying to share knowledge with others, this morning I want us to think about uh, the process and the importance of knowledge with love. So in verse 1, Paul says, we know that we all have knowledge. So he begins by affirming that nothing he's going to say after this diminishes the importance of knowledge. In Romans chapter 10 and verse 14, after saying that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved, he says, well, how then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? So no one has faith without knowledge. So if we understand the importance of faith, then we pretty automatically then understand the importance of knowledge. In 1 Timothy 2 and verse 4, God desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. And then as we read in 2 Peter chapter 1 just a moment ago, that the grace and mercy of God is multiplied to us in the knowledge of God and of His Son and the, all that is needed for life and godliness that is in the knowledge of God. 
So Paul and, and Peter and, and, and Jesus uh, all affirm the importance of knowledge. You can't replace that role with, with anything else. Uh, these questions that are on the board are, are two questions or statements that uh, were, were made in the course of the past week, and, and of course there were others. And so does, does knowledge matter? Does it matter how someone would answer that question? Does it matter to God? And does it matter for that person's eternity uh, what the answer is, what, the knowledge, what knowledge is needed in order to answer those questions or any other question that may be asked? Well, of course that knowledge is needed. That the, the, the importance of knowledge is emphasized in Ephesians 4 and verse 11 that Jesus gave the apostles and prophets and he's given evangelists and pastors and teachers to work among the saints, to equip the saints. So what all of those workers primarily have in common is the, the teaching that they do, the importance of knowledge. That's, that's why we have Bible classes. That's uh, not just a way to pass the time, but we, we go to the length and to the effort to even divide up into age groups. Why, why do we do that? Well, to try to share that knowledge at, at the level best we can uh, at, at, with each one. And then that's also, I don't know if it's primarily or secondarily, it's also a prop, the process of developing teachers. How do you have teachers? It's, it's those who begin by teaching the first principles. And whatever level, whatever age uh, you are teaching, if you're teaching, you know well, you end up learning the most. That's why reading the Bible by yourself is essential so that you gain that knowledge and uh, it's important you you set your own pace and maybe you pick your own topic uh, that that's an important part it's good we can come together and and you trust me week to week to choose the topics and i don't always know well is this the topic that's most needed for uh, whoever will be here i can't answer all of that so you need to be reading the scriptures of course because knowledge is essential and nothing that Paul says here or anywhere else would, would minimize or deny that. But he goes on to say in verse 1, yes, we all have knowledge. But then he makes this statement that knowledge puffs up. Not, uh, not that knowledge is the problem, but knowledge in the absence of love is the point that he's making. And that's among, if you've read the rest of Corinthians, then you know that was among the problems there. So yes, many of them had knowledge. Some of them even had miraculously revealed knowledge. But knowledge in the absence of love puffs up. But love combined with knowledge edifies. Let's be reminded of, of 1 Corinthians chapter 13 where Paul, Paul makes this uh, as plain as could be. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 verses 1 through 3. He says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I become a sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. Now, the things that he mentions here, the miraculous gifts that they had, the generosity that he describes, the knowledge, and even being a martyr, even dying. Other people might benefit if that happened, if by, by those things happening. And even if I don't have love, others might benefit. But he says it, it profits me nothing. I, I don't gain anything from that. But all of these things, of course, the other side of that, all of these things with love, they not only help to bring others to Christ or to bring others closer to Christ, they also then benefit the giver as well. And that's God's intent, that in all giving it, it be more blessed to give than to receive. Now go back to chapter 12. Knowledge puffs up, and he describes a couple of those problems back in chapter 12. For example, in verse 21, Knowledge puffs up with this mindset. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. Here, knowledge has puffed some up so that they inflate uh, their, their own importance. And so because you don't have uh, what I have, you don't do what I do. I'm, I'm a longtime member or I'm new, I'm young or I'm old. 
Uh, I'm a preacher, I'm an elder, I'm a teacher, just man can fill, has filled in that blank in a lot of ways. Well, then that, that just automatically means I should get my way. And that, that's the spirit of, of Diotrephes in 3 John. Uh, that, that person can have a great deal of knowledge, but nobody benefits from their knowledge when this is the way that they use their knowledge. But when that kind of knowledge is combined with love, then the focus is not upon my way, but upon what Paul says at the end of chapter 12 on the more excellent way. And the more excellent way is that knowledge is combined with the love of God. And so then others are benefited as well as myself. What edifies may or may not be popular when he's talking about love, and we discussed this in, in class this morning as well, uh, that, that our society uses the word love primarily associated with, with feelings, but that's not what Paul is, is discussing in this chapter. He's talking about the, the commitment that they have to others. And so when I'm committed to others, what will help them, what will strengthen them, what will edify them may not be popular, it may not be liked, it may not even be received by them, but what is offered uh, still can edify when that knowledge is combined with love. There's another way that is a little more subtle in which uh, arrogance or pride can be demonstrated, and that's, that's when I hide my knowledge. In 1 Corinthians 12, uh, here's a different problem in verses 15 and 16. If the foot should say, well, because I'm not a hand, I'm not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I'm not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? In this illustration, the ear knows what it can do, but it's, it's as though the ear is saying, well, I'm not going to hear. I, I'm not going to do what I'm able to do because I, what I'm able to do is not what someone else is able to do. And so that this is more subtle because to, to know what I can do and then not to do it, that, that's, that's a form of self-control. That, well, I'm, I'm not going to do what God has, has given me to do because God hasn't given me to do what I wanted to do. That, that's another kind of pride and of arrogance. The other is more obvious, the one who makes it clear I, I'm so important, but it's a different kind of pride to just fade into the background when there's work that God has given us to do. With love, though, borrow from, from Jeremiah, when, when he was suffering because of his willingness to speak, uh, the time came where he became so uh, discouraged because what he was doing was not being received that he just decided, I, I said, I will not make mention of him nor speak any more in his name. God, God had sent him to do that. Uh, but the response had, had just been so... Uh, so minimal, he just decided it wasn't worth speaking anymore. But notice this. But his word was in my heart, like a burning fire shut up in my bones. I was weary of holding it back, and I could not. And so Jeremiah has the knowledge here. And then when it was combined with love, then he spoke. And I don't know that the reaction of anyone was really changed, just because his mindset returned to, to what it was before. But his, his reaction changed, his response to what God had given him to do. That's what changed. And so what, what puffs up and what edifies? This is what Paul is, is reminding them of here. In, in either case, in, in either expression of pride, others are not edified. Uh, the community around us, the lost, have so many misconceptions of God and of salvation and of his people and of his church, then if, if I inflate my importance and I try to share my knowledge with an inflated view of my importance, people will see that. And so now, now there's a bigger mess because they, they still may not know any better. They still not lack knowledge. And yet, if I lack love, now, now we're both lost. We're both, and neither one is able to help the other. What you know will only benefit others if you have a genuine interest in their soul. And so if I could borrow from James chapter 2, he talks about faith and works. But think about the couple of the well-known statements of James and just apply them to knowledge and to love. 
You know, he said, as the body without the spirit is dead, he said, so faith without works is dead also. Would it not also be true, as the body without the spirit is dead, so knowledge without love is, is dead also. It, it profits nothing. And he says, you see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. James chapter 2. Maybe we could also say, you see then that a man who seeks to edify does so by love and not by knowledge only. Both of those work together. Faith and works and knowledge and love. And so Paul tries to impress that upon them, not by minimizing the importance of knowledge, but by emphasizing the importance that knowledge be with love. Back to the text in 1 Corinthians chapter 8. He goes on to say, And if anyone thinks that he knows anything, he knows nothing yet as he ought to know. So if what I know leads me to be puffed up, and either to inflate my importance or to, uh, to hide my knowledge, then Paul says, well, in that case, you just don't know as much as you think that you know. But the contrast to that in verse 3, he says, but if anyone loves God, this one is known by him. Being known by God is the goal of knowledge. Being known by God is the goal of, of love. Think about both of those for a moment. Think about knowledge. Turn to Romans chapter 2. Now, why, why would I want to know anything about God if that knowledge does not result in me being known by God? What, what good does it for me uh, to know the, the depths of whatever God has revealed about Himself if that knowledge doesn't lead me to be known by Him? And of course, that means not just not just that God knows my name, of course He does, but this is talking about the, the relationship that He brings in bringing us to Himself. In Romans chapter 2, verses 18 through 20, here Paul writing to the, to the Jew, he says that you know His will and approve the things that are excellent, being instructed out of the law, and are confident that you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes. Anything wrong with all of that? No, that would be a, the right place to be. He says, having the form of knowledge and truth in the law, you therefore who teach another, do you not teach yourself? So here Israel has great zeal and great knowledge, and that's what we're going to study tonight from uh, uh, Romans chapter 10, zeal according to knowledge. And so he, he mentioned, introduces that here, that in Israel you have great zeal and you have great knowledge, but something is missing. And here what he describes is just the, the, the integrity to do what you're teaching other people to do. That, that can be missing. Uh, what might also, though, be, lit, be missing, as it was in Corinth, is, is love, the love of Deuteronomy 6, that you love the Lord with all your heart and soul and mind, and your neighbor as yourself, uh, in the absence of that, then all of the knowledge that he describes here is, is useless. Proverbs 1 and verse 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of, the beginning of knowledge. So my, my knowledge is not the, the, the goal. Uh, in fact, my, my knowledge is not even the first foundation. It, it's connected, I guess you, I should say, to the fear of the Lord. And the fear of the Lord doesn't drive me away from God. The fear of the Lord is what drives me to, to want to know more so that I know Him better, so that I am known by Him. And so knowledge is, is a part of, Paul doesn't emphasize that here, but we've talked about that already. And so if anyone, uh, if anyone is going to be known by God, they, they have to have knowledge. But then what Paul emphasizes here, if anyone loves God, this one is known by Him. Again, we discussed this in, in our study of Jude this morning. Love is probably the, among the most well-known words of the Bible, and yet among the least understood words that, that God has spoken. Uh, that, that was evidenced in a variety of ways if you were at the booth or at the fair in, in, in either way, uh, this slogan that has increased 
Love is love. That's shallow, it's empty, but people wear it and say it as though it's, it's really something deep and, and affirms something. Well, that, that's false. Love is not self-explanatory. Love isn't responsible for love's own existence. Uh, love, love has to have a source. And in Matthew chapter 22, verses 37 through 39, when Jesus was, at, was asked in regards to the Old Covenant, the First Covenant, the covenant of Moses, well, what, what's the greatest commandment? Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So I, I suppose that some people there were surprised he didn't cite one of the ten, the ten commandments. But Jesus said before the ten, there, there are these two. And then out of these two, the first is that you, uh, you, you, not, you not begin with your neighbor. You don't begin by, by pleasing your brother. It must first be directed to God. And how, I, how do I direct my love to God without knowing what, the love, what kind of love God has and what kind of love He has revealed and what kind of love He has shown? And so this is what then guides me. First, knowing the God, the love that God has for us and what that love is and what that love means. Then I return that love to God and then I know how to please my neighbor and then I know what is good for my neighbor and for my brethren. So Paul here, when he says, if anyone loves God, this one is known by him. He's not making an overarching, uh, simplistic statement that, well, love is all you need. There's some song, I think, from before I was born, and that's just what echoes and echoes and echoes in that song beat into the minds of our society. Love is all you need. Love is all you need. That's not what, what Paul is saying. Well, love is all you need to be known by God uh, because, as we've shown, there is no love without knowledge, but because of the conditions in Corinth, some had knowledge, but they lacked this love. And so to them, especially, he's reminding, if anyone loves God, this one is known by him. As, as our time at the fair ends today and some of those unique opportunities, let's not let uh, our, our mindset really change. It's not that, oh, okay, well, our summer of evangelism is over and taking the gospel to the community. Uh, our mindset should remain the same. Uh, let's continue using every opportunity to take the gospel to the community around us and let's continue to examine ourselves. Now, go over to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Because something else that Paul says, even though it's a, a different letter and a different context, needs to sit alongside 2, 1 Corinthians chapter 8. Second Corinthians chapter 10, read with me verses 4 and 5. I'll, I'll back up to verse 3. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. So we have to set that alongside 1 Corinthians chapter 8, don't we? We live in a society that very much, uh, uh, very much would latch on to 1 Corinthians chapter 8. Uh, 1 Corinthians 8, 1 is not as well known as Matthew 7 and verse 1, judge not that you be not judged, but we, we hear that often or maybe hear, hear of that from time to time and the way people abuse that. Well, if the number of people that know Matthew 7, 1, they, they may not read far enough to get to 1 Corinthians 8. But could you imagine if they did, and they came across this statement, oh, well, knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. Can, can you not imagine people quoting that just as often as Matthew chapter 7 and verse 1 and saying, well, see, just don't worry about what people know or what they believe. Just, just love them because that's all, all that really matters. Uh, the problem with the idea that, well, you're puffed up if you're talking to others about their sin. 
people who would say things like that don't realize they're, they're contradicting themselves because are they puffed up by saying that someone else is puffed up? Are they guilty of sin if they're talking to others about talking to others about sin? This, this is just the, the so-called wisdom of man and it just dissipates like a cloud. It, it can't stand. But we, we need to be aware of the mindset of the world so that we're not conformed to this world because even Christians can, can be tempted because we're surrounded by that mindset and that messaging in so many ways. Uh, that, well, you, you, you catch more flies with honey than with vinegar, it's been said. Uh, so just, just preach the truth and don't identify error, the error, the beliefs of other people. Just leave that alone and you just say what, what you think and what you say. Well, you, you may can catch more flies with honey than vinegar, but as a Christian, we're, we're not in the fly-catching business, are we? We're in the business of catching souls. And how do we catch souls? Well, I better go to the, the master fishermen. And what I can find is that we're told to preach the Word, 2, Peter, or 2 Timothy 4, verse 2. And that means in season and out of season. And that means convince and then rebuke and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. So he tells Timothy, you keep teaching, you keep teaching. And in Acts chapter 2, it, we again, this idea of you catch more flies with vinegar, well, sometimes the gospel will taste like vinegar, for a moment at least. In Acts chapter 2, when Peter warned them, uh, rebuked them, that the one that God has made Lord in Christ, you've crucified them, how did that taste at first? It doesn't describe it in the language of the tongue, but of their heart. What does it say? They were pricked in their heart. Not pleasant to be pricked. The gospel pricked their hearts. But then they said, what shall we do? And Peter says, repent. And let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And so Peter knew, Peter knew well how to preach the Word because Jesus sent him out to do that. And on the day of Pentecost, we have uh, the, uh, uh, one of many examples of the nature of expressing love. Paul said in Galatians 4, verse 16, Have I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? In Galatians chapter 6, verses 1 and 2, he says, If anyone be overtaken in a trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of meekness. And by doing this, verse 2, he says, you share one another's burdens, and so you fulfill the law, fulfill the law of Christ. Some people today even say, well, Christ doesn't have any laws, it's just love. Well, that, that love here includes our willingness to love others enough to help them to see their guilt, especially when they're caught up in it and don't see it. So uh, just encourage us with this, not to let others guilt you into silence. Uh, love them and edify them by speaking the truth in love. And in that context, knowledge doesn't puff up. It edifies. So let's continue asking, quest uh, asking questions to the Fairbanks community. The previous two Sundays, we looked at four questions that we put on the banner that, that we tried to, to present to people who walked by. The question, does absolute truth exist? The question, can we be sure that the Bible is from God? The question, true or false? Baptism now saves you, which is a quotation directly from 1 Peter 3, verse 21. So several people passed by this week and they said, well, no, that, that's false. Baptism doesn't save you. Well, just in love, I presented 1 Peter 3 to them and then try to teach and to instruct. And then the fourth question, well, why are there so many different kinds of churches? And some people would respond to each of those questions, well, you just let other people believe what they want to believe. Well, then I, if I do that, if I go along with that, I, uh, that's, uh, I don't have the love of God and I don't have the knowledge of God. So let's keep asking these questions or the people that, that you live among and work among that maybe they need a different question. Let's ask these questions because it's not good for love to be alone. Uh, knowledge can puff up, but it, it doesn't have to. What, what God has joined together, Jesus said in another subject, let not man separate. 
And so God has joined together knowledge and love, and the fruit of that, the result of that, is that that knowledge and that love will edify. It will build, it will build up. It will not return void. And so let's, as we have this past week, to the best of our ability, let's continue this upcoming week to the best of our ability to use the knowledge that God has revealed and use the love that God has revealed to build others up. Turn your songbooks to number 317. Of course, before we could build up, before we could build others up, uh, when we are in our sin, we, we can't build ourselves up. Our sin puts us in the, the worst of positions uh, from which we cannot save ourselves. We're going to sing this song to, to urge each of us at this time to examine ourselves. If there are any here who need to be built up by God, then I urge you, as Peter did those on the day of Pentecost, to repent of your sins with the knowledge that God has made this Jesus who was crucified, both Lord and Christ. With that faith, if you would repent of your sins and be baptized, then God will wash away your sins, add you to Himself, add you to, to His body, to His church. And if you need this day and we can in some way help you and assist you in that, we sing this song to remind you of your sin and of your need before the God of heaven. If you're a Christian and you've turned away from Him, you've turned away from the promise and the commitment and from the blessings that God has given and from the commitment that you made to Him, if you, like Simon, need to repent and pray that God would forgive you and confess your sins to, to God, but if we can help and encourage you in, in returning to Him who, who once saved you and once blessed you, then we offer our, our time and, and our help in any way that we can. If we are as we ought to be in Christ, then let's sing this song with the determination that we're going to serve Him this week and that we'll use the knowledge and the love that God gives us to, to serve Him and to please Him and to bring others to Him. If we can help you in any way, tell us, come tell us how as we stand and sing.